Friday. Hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, April the 15th. Good Friday. And uh, this is question and answers for Backyard Beekeepers, episode number 155. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So I'm glad that you're here. If you're brand new and you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and every topic will be listed there in order along with other links and uh, helpful tips and things like that for you. So I'm glad you're here. Today uh, is the highest pollen day of the week, by the way. So I looked that up and we have maple, poplar, and juniper, and salix discolor, which is also the willow trees. Uh, they have pollen all over them too, so that's kind of interesting. 21 mile an hour winds, and we have 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 94% chance of rain. So let's get right into it. If you have uh, a question that you'd like me to consider for one of the Friday Q&As, please follow the link down in the video description. It'll take you to my main webpage, thewaytobe.org, and you can fill out a form there. And uh, maybe it'll be something that's interesting to everyone. So we'll jump right in with question number one. This is Ray from Monson, Massachusetts, and I made a winter entrance to the top of two deep boxes. So we're probably talking Langstroth Hive here. Now I can't get them to go back down to the bottom entrance. What can I do? Okay, so this is going to happen to a lot of people coming into spring. If you have an upper entrance for your beehives, which I don't anymore, no upper entrance, no upper venting. But if you have one, that's where the bees are right now because that's where the brood is right now. So if you still have the bottom board, landing board entrance, and they're not using it, I don't recommend just coming in and closing off that upper entrance like at nighttime, for example. And you might think, well, then they'll just use that bottom entrance. You might not know what's going on inside the hive yet. So I think with the next, leave them using the top entrance for now. And then when the weather's warm enough and you can get in there and do an inspection of the hive, because you want to make sure they have a clear path to that bottom entrance. If we just close off the top and we don't know what's going on in between the upper entrance where the brood is and the bottom entrance and the landing board, then uh, we may be sealing off their only entrance now. So I would wait till we can do an inspection, clear out the bottom, make sure the bottom entrance is available to them. And then the next night after that, close off the upper entrance and make them use the bottom entrance. A common thing that'll be going on this time of year. So that's pretty good. Number two, Barry Parrish from Oakland, California. It says my Varroa monitoring is the bee scanning app. I am full in, no other monitoring. All treatment decisions are photography based, but boy, I hate the fussing with the phone cam in the sunny apiary under a hood and in gloves. It's awful. So the question here is about the bee scanning app is an app for your phone. And uh, what you do is you have to pull a frame of brood out. Usually it's a brood frames where we do varroa counts and you put it on a bracket and then you take four pictures. And I believe it's 10 centimeters. I'll put a link down in the video description for this question uh, because the website uh, for bee scanning actually has a jig that they'd like you to make. And that's to make sure that if you've got the frame here that your cameras are the right distance from it and that you're getting four good shots. It doesn't have to be super elaborate, but one of the things that uh, is included in this comment here is that it's a pain to take it out, plus with gloves and everything else. Well, maybe swap out your work gloves for nitrile gloves or something thinner so they have greater dexterity and things like that. That's what I use a lot. And uh, having a bracket to set it on, and there are camera holders, by the way, and I think their website has a jig recommended for the camera. So that's automatic, you know, rest it, take a shot, rest it, take a shot, take a shot, take a shot. Plus you save those pictures and you can make comparisons the next time you come in to do an inspection. There's one thing in here that said, uh, that stated, where this is my only means of checking now for Varroa. I think it's a good way to check if you find that you have a high Varroa count. I think it's really good that then you'll know that you'll need to treat that colony. But I'm not perfectly comfortable saying that it would make a brood frame clear of varroa mites just because the camera didn't see them on the backs of the bees. So I'm not quite there yet with my confidence in that. But if you do it and it's working out for you, okay, that's good. But uh, 
I highly recommend that it's a cursory thing because I think they're they're still developing it. They say they've taken into consideration that if there's one mite visible on the back of the bee, for example, that, that represents a much higher mite count on that frame of nurse bees. And the advantage, of course, is you don't have to shake them, you don't do sugar rolls, you don't do alcohol washes and things like that, and the results are immediate, documented, and you have a record also because that app is called Bee Scanning. So for those of you who want to check that out, but like I said, I don't use it to consider a colony clear, but it does give me an early indication that this is a colony, if there is a high mite count, that would require treatment. Four photos on a standard deep frame, uh, so one for each quarter, and of course you hold the camera horizontal so you get a panoramic shot of that, and they have great instructions on their website for exactly how to do that. But that's my recommendation there. Question number three, Nathaniel Satterley from Fort Scott, Kansas. Got the notification from Man Lake this week that my bees had shipped and would arrive in a few days. That same day, I went ahead and got my hive set up. Frames and everything, some with better comb, some with wax foundation. I put on the outer cover and closed up the entrances, but now I'm wondering if I got too excited for my first hive and jumped the gun. Still waiting the package bees. I went out a couple days later to check for any intruders and found a yellow jacket and a couple scout ants inside despite my attempts at blocking the entrance. I got them out easy enough, but I wonder now if I might have made things more challenging for the new bees by giving potential invaders a head start. So here's the thing. I don't think it's a problem because ants are not generally a big problem. But when you have hive equipment setting out ahead of time, uh, one of the things that's going on in the spring is you mentioned the yellow jacket wasp. Paper wasps of all species, the queens are out making new nests. So this can happen where they'll build a nest right on the inner cover. So when you have your inner cover on the top box, they start to build a nest up underneath if there's no bees occupying the box. So when you get your package, of course, pull everything apart and inspect, but you'll see them anyway, but be prepared to deal with a wasp. But no, I don't see any problem with setting things up and the ants generally, they're just looking for shelter. They're not a problem for the bees. And when the bees move in, they'll chase them out as they need to. So ants don't generally do a lot of harm to the bees, depending on where you live and what the species of ant is. But the black ants and the little tiny ants, sugar ants that we have around here, not that big of a deal. So question number four comes from John Menacal. I'm in the Mid-Atlantic, Annapolis area, on the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. I'm adding a nuke on April 23rd, bringing the hive total to three. Dandelion carpet is spreading nicely here. Should I feed the nuke one-to-one -one sugar water? I use a rapid round, or should I add pollen patties to help them grow and get moved into their new home? Okay, so to answer that part, in the spring I would put uh, the one-to-one -one sugar syrup on if you're installing a new nuke or a package of bees. I don't think the pollen patties are that useful right now because there's a lot of pollen already coming in from the environment. In fact, the pollen counts are really high, so a lot of people are having allergy issues right now. And I think you're good there, so no pollen patty, yes, on the one-to-one -one sugar syrup for as long as they can take it. You're just starting them up, you're not going to draw honey off of that. So FYI, my standard configuration is two deeps with better bee, better cone that I installed myself on wooden frames. I also use plastic mediums for honey supers and thanks to a friend who got a bunch of gear from a former beekeeper. I'm going to experiment with one Ross round. So also for those who want to know what Ross rounds are, for cut comb, I will put that down in the video description so you can see a link on exactly how that works because cut comb is in heavy demand, especially with the older population and for those who have colds and things like that, who want to chew comb honey. It's good stuff. Ross rounds, half hogs, lots of ways to do it, but uh, this is a good way to go. So thanks for that. Question number five. John Charles uh, from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. My question is in regards to your use of sugar spray supplemented with Honey Bee Healthy versus a smoker. 
What I'm wondering is, with your use of Hive Alive, have you or are you planning on changing the mix in favor of Hive Alive? I've only purchased and smelled the Hive Alive. So I'm wondering if that pheromone interrupting benefit would hold true as it does with Honeybee Healthy. So this is what we're talking about. And what I had in the thumbnail today, Hive Alive, Honeybee Healthy. Very expensive. <clears throat> Also expensive, but not as much as this. So, Honeybee Healthy Original Formula, Feeding Stimulant is how it's listed, and then Hive Alive. They do the same things, but they also do a little bit different things. I would hold the Hive Alive Syrup in reserve because it's actually a treatment, even though it has essential oils in it as well. It has seaweed extracts and things like that that are proven to be beneficial for Nozema. So we're coming out of the high-risk Nozema season so I would shelf the Hive Alive. And for my sugar syrup extender, I would use Honey Bee Healthy. It's also proven to work when you're introducing queens and things like that. Sorry, I have to keep cutting out because I have a cold and uh, I don't want to have a recording of myself coughing or blowing my nose. So expect interruptions today. Uh, so for question number five, that pretty much does it. Honey Bee Healthy. Um, use that for your sugar extender in place of smoke on really hot days. Uh, the bees really come out and look forward to it. They recognize the scent and you can use that in lieu of uh, a smoker. But I would not use Hive Alive as a substitute for that just because Hive Alive is more expensive. They do smell different because there's Tymol in the Hive Alive as well. And the medication dose is uh, one gallon uh, once it's mixed with sugar syrup for the hive alive to treat a colony and then you can go back to straight sugar syrup if it's a colony that needs it if it's a standard colony you might need to do that at all but hive alive is much more expensive i would hold that in reserve question number six marvin ratting from novo illinois I made a mistake last year and i and i now want to fix it when I installed the package of bees, I took a frame out to make room for the queen cage, and by the time I got back to remove the cage, the bees had started building honeycomb in the space where the queen cage was. I didn't think it was a big deal, so I left it. Then this year, when I went to do my first hive inspection, I realized that when I extracted the frame, I was damaging some brood comb because I did could see the white bee larvae exposed. So usually for the bridge area, bridge comb and stuff like that, the larvae that you tend to tear apart when you're pulling frames and boxes, usually drones. Is this something I need to do to remove the honeycomb from between the two frames and they are attached to the frame on either side? So me personally, uh, and eventually most everybody has made this mistake, not pushing all the frames together and things like that. And the bees do build their comb in there uh, I just take a knife and cut that comb out. If it so happens that there's brood in it and you want to save those, you can take a foundationless frame and put rubber bands around it and hold that comb in that frame and then put the frame in the space that uh, you left. But I would definitely cut it apart because now it's attached to both frames, which as described here, keeps you from um, doing a thorough inspection without causing a lot of damage. And ultimately you're gonna have to fix it anyway so another fix to that, you're, you're going to have to cut it. You're going to cut the beeswax no matter what. But uh, you can also migrate those frames together, the three. So you have the foundationless frame. And since it's attached or adjacent frames, you can slide them together to the end and try to get them to use the central frame. So that's what I do. You can cut it out, put it with rubber bands into a foundationless frame, just like people do when they're doing extractions from buildings and they're cutting comb and transferring it to the deep frames or just get rid of it if it doesn't have uh, brood and things that you want to save in there. You're going to have a nice, long, sharp knife ready to do that. Question number seven, Bryce Bennett, Holderness, New Hampshire. My question is, when you, my question is, can you, while splitting a strong colony at a queen frame, into a queenless split to have them polish the cups. Then can I place the queen frame in the queen right colony and get the queen to lay the frame up and then return the frame 
back to the queen list split for them after I finish the cell. Is all that possible? That is a very complicated description. So, um, what I'm suggesting is, since you have a queen right colony and a colony that does not have a queen, rather than trying to do a queen um, cell production frame, because it kind of sounds like that's what's being described here, and hoping that they clean up those queen cells and will lay eggs in those queen cells, and there's a lot of ifs and buts in that because we don't know if the queen will even respond to those cells in a queen right colony, remember. But what you can do is find a frame of brood with some eggs and open brood and transfer that frame into your nucleus and then get them to build because they're without a queen. They'll pick one of those eggs and they'll start to make, or even several, and they'll start to make their queen cells off of that much better gamble than trying to get a queen to lay an egg in queen cells and having the bees clean those up, for example. So I think that'll work fine if you can just pull a frame of brood with eggs, put those in your queenless colony and let them rear their own queen. Much more sure game, in my opinion, that way than trying to get them to work to establish queen cells. So next is question number eight from Blake in Idaho Falls, Idaho. I greatly appreciate an answer to a question that has been troubling me. Last week, I opened up a lands hive that had Italians in it, and it was one of my strongest hives on November 17th and the 22nd of 2021. I did oxalic acid vaporization treatments on this hive. I gave a total of 7 grams of oxalic acid with the Laura B vaporizer. That's the tool that I used in the oxalic acid works from Better B with the USDA label, so that's apobioxal. And when I gave the treatment, I used a wet rag that I think affected the temperature administering the treatment. And uh, you had in an episode spoke about the temperatures and higher temps and so on. I found the bees all on the floor of the hive with no bees on the comb. There was a little bit of brood, maybe 50 sealed brood on a lands frame. The bees were still coated with OA, and as some frames have a gray film on them, some honey frames appear normal. Can I use some of these frames in a future colony in the same hive? Well, you could use the frames again. Having a dusting of oxalic acid vapor crystallized now on the frames is not necessarily detrimental. Although I will have to say a 7 gram dose is uh, way beyond the label of what's on that APA box on package, by the way. So you did overdose them. But uh, as far as it being safe for future use, uh, the apoboxyl itself would not make it detrimental. You can even harvest that honey for human consumption. And you'd probably be okay. So you also, it says you want to burn the inside of the hive to sanitize it. And can you use the honey in any format? So yeah, I would extract the honey and let the next uh, colony start fresh. So next is question number nine from William Haas from Charlotte, Michigan. I have a question as to what is the best sugar to feed your bees. I've been told that only sugar cane sugar should be used for, bee for feeding bees. However, the nutritional label on both sugar packages appears to be the same. If this is true, could you please explain? Now this comes up from time to time because people get upset over pure cane sugar. This is processed white sugar. Sometimes it's sourced from beets. Sometimes it's short, sourced from cane, sugar cane. And uh, studies have been done. And uh, it makes no difference to the bees whatsoever. It's a source of sucrose. Uh, once you mix it up for sugar syrup, they really don't care one way or the other. I use cane sugar for mine. But uh, there's been no science, no publications, no studies done that demonstrate that beet sugar source for processed white sugar that gets used to mix up for syrup for the bees is any different in performance with the bees than the straight cane sugar is. So I think that uh, a lot of people have worried about that for no reason. So I think you're safe to use either. But uh, I don't know if there's much of a price difference in the two. And sometimes it's not easy to even find out. It's white processed sugar, so making sure that they've sourced it from cane, if that's what you're after, you have to look into the company. So question number 10, Marty B. 
Is that really your last name, Marty? Trapper Creek, Alaska. Hello, Fred. Can you tell me or direct me to someone who would know if North American honeybees nest outside in the open air? While in Florida this spring, outside of Jacksonville, I saw a massive colony of honeybees nesting on the outside of a tree. Not to be confused with a swarm, this was a very well-established nest with massive comb structures suspended from the trunk of the tree. I know in other parts of the world this is common, but I've never heard of it in America. Is this an anomaly, or is it not uncommon in the South? Well, not just the South, by the way. So what we're talking about is when the bees swarm out and they go to make a, uh, a new colony, they're bivouacking in a temporary location. That's when you see them on the tree branches, on the fence, on someone's soffit, on their gutter, wherever. So for the bees, that's a temporary spot. And in the meantime, their scouts are going out everywhere looking for a new place to live. So their goal is to move into a cavity. Now, we're doing Apis mellifera. There's Apis mellifera serrana, which is the Africanized honeybee. Where they come from, they do build their comb unprotected. So their only protection is the bees themselves. And of course, it's in a much warmer climate. So what happens is, while they're stuck there in their temporary position, they start to build on honeycomb. And you'll even see little bits of comb on uh, beeswax comb, on tree branches and things like that when they've been there for a long time. And that means they couldn't find a place to live. So it doesn't just happen in the South. In fact, uh, a member of my beekeepers association uh, shared pictures this year of big comb segments where the bees had just built onto the branch of a tree. And as winter came, of course, they couldn't sustain themselves against the weather and they died out, but they built a full size um, comb structure and they survived all through the winter into fall but then of course they couldn't stand being exposed to the elements and they died out and then you find it in the spring. So it happens when they can't find a place to live. And that's how that happens. It's rare but it can happen anywhere and uh, they'll just start to nest wherever they happen to be. So let's move on really quick to my shout out for today. Uh, we're in the fluff section now, so thank you for those who submitted questions. If I didn't answer your question, please don't give up. Submit another one for next week if it's important. And uh, normally I like to pick somebody that's doing a startup or, you know, their channel's not well viewed. Unfortunately, I'm going to direct you to someone in today's shout out that is actually very well viewed. But it's an interesting area and something I think about today because I have a cold right now. <clears throat> Dr. Leo Sharashkin uh, interviewed him recently and we talked about uh, you know the health of being around honeybee hives and the air that's coming from the hive. So the shout out today goes to a channel that is really huge. It's actually off-grid with Doug and Stacy. Most of you, if you've been looking into bees at all, you've come across this off-grid channel. They have a huge following. But their most recent videos with Dr. Leo and what is he doing? Uh, the title of the video is The Most Unusual Beehive in the World. Well, it's not really the most unusual beehive in the world because it, it does exist in other countries. But it's a horizontal hive configuration and Dr. Leo Sharashkin is HorizontalHives.com. HorizontalHive.com. And uh, so it's like a coffin. It's a horizontal hive and then in this video they have a building around it and a place for you to lay down on the hive like a coffin. And then it closes up, there's a window there, probably a south facing window. And it's designed for holistic treatment, for apotherapy. And uh, that's my shout out for today. I'm gonna give you a link to that. Please tell them I said hello. We're probably not gonna even be a tiny blip on their view counts or subscription base, but it is an interesting video and I highly recommend you watch it. I want to thank you for being here today and have a fantastic weekend.
So, a funny thing happened on the way to the bee yard today. I went out to do landing board documentation and update my records. What do you think was going on? One of my hives decided to swarm today of all days with rainstorms coming in. So if you've got stereo headphones on, get ready for an audio treat. You're going to have bugs all over you. Now what I had with me, of course, to document my B file information is my cell phone. So this is videoed with the cell phone. I'm actually kind of surprised at the audio and the video quality. It's what I had with me at the very end. Of course, I will carry on with another better video camera and give you a better explanation. But this just goes to show what can happen. Swarm starts out, moments notice, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, so this isn't even prime swarm time. Normally you'd expect them to take off around noon or later when things are warmer, clearer, but we have rainstorms coming in. And as I said before, that's why I'm so surprised to see them take to the air. But what's interesting too is that uh, things don't go as planned for the bees either. And I'm going to talk about what I do with them. And I'm also going to describe what we're looking at. If you're a new beekeeper and you see something like this, well, this is the birth of a new colony of bees. The resident queen is flying out a bunch of the workers are going with her and this is what we consider a prime swarm because it's one of the first ones that happens in spring and involves the greatest number of workers going with them. This particular hive is a 10 frame which means there's 10 frames per box. Single deep and it has been supered and not all the supers were full so that did not work. This same colony was doing fire drills on April 18th and I did a video of that. So I knew it was coming. Their population was good. Look at all the drones in here. Drones are male bees. Lots of genetics. Often we see drones fly with a swarm. And of course today, the time of this video sequence was May 4th. So that was just yesterday. Today the weather's too cold, it's too bad. They uh, would not have done very well had I not intervened. And I'm gonna talk about what happened and what I did about it later on. So for now, you can just appreciate the fact that the bees are flying in every direction. They're hovering around and I was looking to see what tree they might land on. Normally they land on one of the spruce trees, a maple branch, something nearby. How fast does a swarm of bees travel? About six miles an hour, so you can follow them as they go, but if they go too high, there's nothing you can do. Today was the last day I expected to have any kind of swarming activity just because of the weather forecast. Bees are generally pretty smart. And they head out when things are prime. We have a nice dandelion bloom going on. I know that's not the best nutrition, but it is a resource for the bees. And uh, so they do have what they need to get going. Turns out, this hive, of course, is full of pollen stored. It's got plenty of capped honey still. In fact, there's a medium super, wall to wall, 10 frames, full of capped honey. So they have everything they need to reproduce. I'll just let you watch for now. And at about the nine minute mark, I'll continue my explanation about what happened here and what I did about it. Enjoy the audio those of you with headphones. And if you want to know what kind of phone this is, it's a Samsung Galaxy. So the audio is kind of rough because the bees are all over my phone right now. I'm surprised they're not clamoring over the top of the camera lens. And of course they're climbing all over me, they're climbing all over my hands, they're up and down my neck here. And they're starting to beard, here they are on my hand. And I have to be careful when I hold the phone because I don't want to squash any bees. I wish I could take a picture of the phone itself, but because I'm using the phone I can't. Remember I was just coming out here to document landing board activities. 
see how much pollen is coming in per minute, all the normal stuff. Updating my records. Now they're climbing all over the camera. What I didn't realize too is that there's a big cluster of bees developing behind my right shoulder. So I had plenty of bees with me. Why aren't they stinging me? They're in swarm mode. They're heading out. Their honey crops are full of honey because they load up before they go so they can last several days if they need to in a temporary bivouac location. I had a bee right on the microphone there. So just don't smoosh them and everything is fine. I do have a long sleeve shirt on. Not wearing a bee suit. You can see some of them have their Nazanoff gland sticking up in the air trying to keep everybody together. They're actually massing against the hive itself now, and some seem to be going back in. So did the queen come out yet? I don't think so, but I'm sticking around. I stayed right here with my phone and decided to document it as they go, because if I see the queen come out, I'm going to grab her. Grab the queen, get some control. If I can get the queen when she leaves and control where she goes and put her in a queen clip, which I don't happen to have one on me at the moment, but I would carry her with me and put her in a queen clip so I can control her. That will prevent this colony from losing all its workforce and give me time to do the split that I've been putting off for so long. Why didn't I do the split before now? Well, to be honest, we haven't had the weather necessary to make that a good call. So this is the result of procrastination. Sorry about that, these are on the camera lens. All over them left hand too. They just clamor everywhere. They're non-defensive, remember? Because they're swarming. So if you don't slap your hands together or put your hand on something and trap a bee in between your fingers, you won't be stung. At least normally you won't be, but look where the bees are gathering now. They didn't go to a nearby tree, so somewhere, I'm guessing, the queen is still here. You can also see that they're starting to gather up underneath the hive visor there, which is a good idea because, as I said before, it's starting to sprinkle, actually. Now look over here. Some of them are gathering on this little tree branch, which is only about 12 feet away from where the hive sits. This is trying to find out if the queen is here on this cluster. Pretty weak cluster, so I'm not super convinced that she's in there. So I'm actually going to go away, get a better camera, and be right back and continue this documentation of what's going on out here. And I'll tell you how I solve my problem. 
Ah, uh, so now we're making the switch to a better camera. And we can see things closer because I want you to get in here tight and see exactly what's going on. See those abdomens in the air? See that light patch at that bottom segment of their abdomen? That's an Asanoff gland and they're recalling the bees. So all of those that were in the air, ready to go with the queen, have changed their minds and have returned to the hive. So what's that mean? Well, it means they're clustered all over the outside. So what does that tell you too? If they all don't go back inside the hive, they're still determined to go somewhere. But what happens soon is we start getting some rain and when the rain starts to fall, it changes everything. But I wanted you to get a really good close look at the bees that are on the outside. What we're looking at here are the workers, of course, and they're clinging to one another. And they would like to be on a tree branch somewhere by now, bivouacking, collecting themselves, and then looking for a new cavity to occupy. But that has been thwarted by the weather. So they really, though, can't change their minds. They have to go now. Because what I found later was, when I took the hive apart, I found that there were plenty of queen cells already capped. Once those queen cells are capped, they've made their decision and they're gonna go. In fact, normally, uh, they swarm within days of those queen cells being capped and there were multiples. There were at least five queen cells. Some of them, were supersedure cells, which are in the middle of the field of a frame. And I'm sorry, I did not video that. I got in a hurry with the storm coming in. I had to park the camera and do this work without videoing it. There were also swarm cells, nice long ones, big queen cells along the edges of the frames, all in this bottom box. There are three boxes in this hive. They're all 10 frames. So we have one deep and then two mediums. So the medium directly above this deep is full of honey and full of bees, I might add. And the box above that is only half drawn with comb. It has plastic foundation in it and plenty of room for expansion. So the need for space was not what stimulated them to move on. So I pulled it apart and pulled out frames of brood and eggs and everything else and transferred them into another hive. And I'll show you the new hive and talk more about that in a second. So here we are today, May 5th. And look at the temperature, 43 degrees Fahrenheit. It's terrible. We have the potential for rain. And I'm going to go outside here and show you what's going on. This is the aftermath. I, of course, split the hive apart. We had about nine frames of brood, pollen, resources, and uh, eggs at all levels. Well, eggs at all levels. We had eggs in there. We had larvae at all levels, capped, uncapped. If they're capped, they're pupa. If they're uncapped, they're larva. And there were very tiny C-shaped larva and nice fat Michelin men looking larva. And this is the hive that I put them in. So I pulled four frames out, four out of nine. Put them in this Flow Hive 2 Plus. And of course, look, there's a drone. They tossed them out already. They're not playing games anymore. It's cold and they're in a new hive and they got the resources. What else did I transfer? I think I got the queen with this group because I like to move the queen first, but if I missed her, it really doesn't matter because I included some of the capped queen cells on the frames in this one as well as capped brood which is going to give them reinforcements and of course open larvae everything else in both hives so both hives now have queen cells one of them has the queen but what i hope i did was pulled enough of the workers away and i shook off the queen hopefully into this box and I also shook off a bunch of nurse bees because those are the ones we want. You can see the hive is a little unstable there. And uh, with the legs on that flow hive, I can adjust it and make it perfectly level. So they've also got a half a gallon of sugar syrup one to one to help them out in that top box. This is the hive that we took them away from and we're looking back. This is not what's going on right now. 
just giving you a look back at how many of the bees were ready to leave the hive. Looked like more than half the population. But remember too, even though I didn't show you because I ran around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to uh, get these guys situated in another box so I wouldn't lose them all together. And I accomplished that because they don't look like they've got the, the desire to swarm anymore. So by reducing the numbers and leaving the extra queen cells in there, I guarantee that no matter which box the queen is in, they're going to continue because they're going to hatch yeah. out a new queen or turn against those queens and their queen cells and chew them out and get rid of them, which they've done in the past. So either way, they're going to make it. Yeah. Hope this was helpful. Almost lost my bees. It was worth going out in the bee yard. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. We'll do a follow-up on this in the coming weeks and see exactly what happened. I'm also going to show you how to figure out which box the queen ended up in. What do you think the answer to that is? What will we find in the brood box that got the queen as compared to the box where the queen was taken away from? Catch you next time. Thanks for watching.